I'll just start again. Thanks guys for making time to um, participate in this input session to hear a bit more about our research and to hopefully uh, be involved in the work that we're doing. Yeah. Um, this is the session for online experiments and trials. Okay, um, you have to do it for your phone. Oh, there we go. We've got some um, microphone from Catherine. Hi, Catherine. Hello, how are you? Good, thank you. Whereabouts are you from, Catherine? Uh, Karinga Council. Okay, so it looks like most of the people online today are from uh, New South Wales um, and obviously Linda from Victoria. That will change throughout um, the info sessions. We've uh, very heavily advertised this in New South Wales and Victoria because that's where my and Behaviour Works networks are. We're definitely interested in um, participation from around the country. Um, so we're recording this session for those people who can't make it. If you have any um, concerns with that at any time, you can let me know. We can pause the recording if you want to share any sensitive information about your council as part of discussing how you might be involved. But obviously there are other people on the line as well. Uh, so we're going to run um, the first session now uh, on online experiments and that'll be followed by a session immediately after on the field trials. Uh, if you're participating in both, you'll find that the beginning of each info session is pretty much identical. Um, but bear with me um, as you hear it the second time. So just a bit of an overview about what we'll um, cover today. So we'll look at three things. I'll just, as I said, start with a little bit of a background about um, Behaviour Works and the Waste Collaboration Project um, and where this research has come from. Then we'll look at um, the idea of trials in general and the particular sort of online experiments and trials that we're planning to um, run as part of this project. And then get into a little bit of detail about what it would mean um, for your organisation to be a delivery partner on one or more of these experiments. This is the first time uh, we're trying this kind of info session um, process to, to kind of hopefully what we're aiming to do is to work with a broader um, selection of councils and other organisations uh, than we have in the past. So uh, feel free to um, stop me at any time to clarify what I'm saying, uh, to also to ask questions. What I have got is kind of uh, built in sections to, um, throughout the presentation to actually stop and have a general discussion and questions. But obviously, if you've got a particular question about, um, you know, to clarify what I'm talking about on the screen at any particular time, don't, don't just kind of sit there puzzling <laughs> about what I'm uh, trying to say. Just let me know and, and I'll see if I can explain it. Um, and your questions will help um, to me to understand what other information that we need to put together to help people decide um, whether that they want to be a delivery partner. Um, so a bit of background about the research. Um, so Behaviour Works, uh, for those of you who knew me in my former life, um, I'm now Behaviour Works Australia, which is at Monash University. Uh, we're a research centre particularly focused on behaviour change um, across a whole wide range of areas. Uh, so we do a number of different things. We do individual um, behavioural science projects where we actually apply um, a behavioural science approach to understanding problems, um, what behaviours are linked to those problems, what ideal behaviours are and how we can bring them about. We have long-term research partnerships with a number of organisations, including um, federal uh, New South Wales and Victorian state government agencies. And we do a whole suite of education and training around um, the use of behaviour science. Um, to uh, change behaviour and uh, <clears throat> I guess in this case, get better outcomes from the community. And uh, Behaviour Works works across a whole range of areas, um, but the, the team that I'm in and the one that I'm most interested today is obviously waste. The so Behaviour Works actually has a consortium um, with a number of partners. Um, so these are some of the partners that uh, I, the Behaviour Works has worked with um, over the last 10 years that it's been operating. Um, and the uh, organisations on the left, um, the environment agencies with the Shannon Company and VicRoads actually form the steering committee or the consortium that actually governs all of Behaviour Works um, direction and strategy. And uh, we do like lots of different types of projects as so different things that we've done have been, you know, currently one of our other projects as part of the Waste and Circular Economy collaboration is looking at how to support businesses to adopt circular economy, um, business models, uh, we've worked with uh, state government agencies to understand how SMEs um, can actually uh, have the chance to respond to information from government and then act on it. And we've worked directly, for example, with businesses looking at how to um, get them to change uh, their behaviour, including what they may or may not be dumping in the environment. Um, we've also done some uh, specifically waste behaviour change projects, which we'll talk about 
in a second for households. Uh, so behaviour works, as I said, adopts a behavioural science approach, um, which is uh, uh, common across a number of um, institutes in Australia. There's the behavioural insights team, the behavioural insights unit that operate with them um, external to government, uh, mostly coming out of the UK. Um, but behaviour works has, through the last 10 years, developed um, what it calls the method, which is a way of understanding how to bring about behaviour change. And we start with a problem focus, looking deeply about what's actually going on, what are the um, system look like, where are problems happening. Then we understand uh, which behaviours of people as individuals, as um, employees or leaders of businesses, as government policy makers, for example, um, are causing, behavior, causing problems or perhaps um, are the ideal behaviours that we want to move to. And then we look in much um, a deep dive kind of at those behaviours and say what's actually causing these behaviours or what's prohibiting the behaviours that we want. And from that, we then go and look at, well, how can we actually uh, change those behaviours and lead to impact? <clears throat> um, and do that through, uh, ideally, a sort of a, a trial approach where we actually test what works um, and collect evidence to actually help everybody um, understand better how to bring about change. So the Waste and Circular Economy Collaboration is um, the first uh, attempt by Behaviour Works and our um, consortium partners to do a very big research program that actually um, spans a number of uh, research interests from a different partners. And it actually brings together, as I said, oh sorry, it, it builds on um, waste projects that we've done over the last eight years, um, looking at, oh, sorry, over the last three years, eight projects looking at the existing evidence around what works to change behaviour. This has covered a whole range of um, waste related things. So policy approaches like plastic bag bans and container deposit schemes, but also particular areas like food waste, litter, um, hazardous waste, um, and most recently, uh, recycling contamination, which uh, is actually, um, originally kickstarted as part of a response to the China um, sword ban by our government um, agencies. But one of the interesting things that comes out as we've done this research on these different topics in the area of waste is that overall there seems to be a real lack of published evidence about what actually works to change the behaviour of individuals or businesses regarding waste. And so we see this as a real opportunity to uh, get people together and actually to try out um, some different in approaches to getting change and measuring that um, in a, in a you know, fairly scientific way to try and create evidence that we can then rely on. And that's the idea behind the Waste and Circular Economy Collaboration. So as I mentioned, uh, it's based on partnerships with a number of federal um, New South Wales and WIC state government agencies uh, who have all pooled their resources to produce this overall collaboration piece of research. Um, the collaboration involves three kind of main um, projects. One is around household commingled recycling contamination. Another one is around business adoption of circular economy models. And a final one around the use of product labels um, and how they can influence both consumer and business uh, behaviour. But the one obviously that we're talking about today is recycling contamination. And what we've done so far is um, a bit of research actually looking at out what's published out there and also talking to stakeholders uh, in government um, and uh, in industry and across a number of um, environmental agencies, as well as uh, reviewing grey literature from a number of state governments and a number of councils who publish um, research or evaluation online. And we've put that all together and um, come up with some areas that uh, obviously commingled uh, contamination in the yellow bin is a really big issue, particularly uh, with the China ban and the potential uh, export ban that's been announced um, now for the next kind of three years. And so what we're really keen to do is distill from this evidence some of the ideas about what seems to work, what's being done by councils at the moment that's quite promising, um, and what's being tried elsewhere to actually see if we can test and replicate and confirm um, some of that evidence so that we can share it and people can be confident that investing in these approaches going forward will actually deliver the, the results. So where we're at now is the trials phase of this project. Sorry, I could just hear a bit of background noise. So, um, if you're not on mute, could you just mute yourself just in case one of you has got them talking in the background? Um, but yeah, so as I said, entering the trial phase and um, what we're looking at at the moment, this particular info section is actually about recruiting delivery partners, um, organisations that are keen to actually uh, implement some of these trials on the ground. The next stage will be actually designing what those trials are going to look like and then implementing um, those interventions and experiments. And at the end of this um, process, 
uh, what we're hoping to do is run a series of policy forums that are basically disseminating what we've learned, the evidence um, and, our, and our learnings from actually delivering trials and testing things out. And the final um, bit of information uh, as background in terms of what we're trying to do with um, waste collaboration is what we're actually focus on, focusing in on contamination. So we've done quite a bit of um, desktop review about what is contamination, why does contamination happen, um, and one of the really interesting things that none of you, I'm sure, will be surprised at is that why something is called a contaminant um, can be quite different. So there's a number of different reasons. It could be because the particular item or the material is technically unrecyclable. It could be because it is recyclable, but at the moment there's no demand for it, so there's no value, um, no price that can be uh, received for it. It could be because the shape of the item prevents it from being able to be sorted through our current kind of... Um, uh, sorting facilities um, at MRFs. It could be because it gets into other materials and actually um, downgrades or contaminates those, might actually damage the equipment. So these are quite different reasons that something can't be recycled through the curbside bin, um, but all of them kind of end up in things being labelled contaminants. And um, the other thing, obviously, someone else is saying. Um, is that what is contamination differs across councils, um, depending on whether or not councils have access to um, automated sorting facilities. Um, so I'm just going to see, I'm just going to mute a few people. So um, Fiona and Elspeth, I've just muted you guys. Um, if you need to speak, you might work out how to unmute yourself there. Um, but yeah, so what is contamination differs across councils, uh, whether you have hand sorting or machine sorted, uh, the type of infrastructure you have access to, sometimes even just how recently your contract um, was renewed with your collections um, and your uh, collections company and your processes um, and a whole, whole range of other reasons. And then finally, what we used um, looking at all of these things and what seems to be uh, the biggest contaminants or the biggest headaches for so many people in different places is that we landed on three main contamination items that we're planning to um, trial throughout these, uh, sorry, test throughout these trials. And they are um, bag recyclables, loose soft plastics and items containing food and liquid. And the reason that we've selected these is because they do actually um, uh, represent different types of issues or behaviours. So bag recyclables is obviously about how people collect their recycling um, it, within the home. Loose soft plastics is actually about how people decide what goes in and what doesn't go in the recycling bin. And items that have food or liquid um, is obviously about um, uh, what they do to an item before they place it in the bin. So they're representing different types um, of behaviours. Um, so hopefully by targeting across these three areas, we'll start to understand what works and doesn't work for different types of behaviours. So that's just a really kind of high level and very quick um, background to where we've come from up until this point. Um, and I do just want to stop quickly and check, does anybody have any questions about the context, about where we've been um, and how we've landed at this place before we start to talk about what's more, much more interesting, which is what we might do with any of you. No, no questions from anybody? Excellent. Okay, so uh, moving on then, I guess one of the things we do is we talk about trials um, quite a lot. We call this the trial phase of the project. And just in case um, some of you aren't familiar with that um, kind of uh, language, just a bit of a really high level kind of idealistic view of what a trial looks like, just to kind of orient your thinking. And then later on, we'll get into the nuts and bolts about what they really might look like. But so. Um, Experimental um, trials, basically the idea is actually to be able to uh, test whether something has actually worked um, and to be quite confident about whether or not that has worked. And so the, the ideal way um, of doing a trial uh, would be like a randomised control trial, if you're familiar with the, the term, but basically what it means is you get a group of people um, that you're going to test um, your intervention with and then you uh, break them into different groups uh, randomly and you assign them to different um, uh, approaches. So some of them might get different types of interventions. For example, you know, an intervention might be um, an education, you know, intervention where you letterbox a whole lot of information and perhaps door knock. Um, another intervention might be uh, changing the, the size or the shapes or the colours of bins, you know, perhaps standardising 
um, bins in like a you know an apartment building uh, bin bay, for example, um, a whole host of other interventions. Um, um, you know, persuasive communications, more like advertising style communications, for example. Um, so some of those groups might be exposed to some of those interventions um, and then other groups you won't do anything with because they kind of provide your check that there aren't other things going on. So with each of your different groups, you either um, give them the intervention or don't. And then uh, once you've done that, you measure what differences there are between the groups to see whether or not what you've done with the group has produced a change um, from the group that you didn't do anything with. And so just as an example, here's kind of a really um, stylistic view of what a trial might look like. You can see in intervention one, we've kind of got five households um, where their performance is improved and one household uh, where it hasn't. Um, in the second one, we had three where it improved and one where it hasn't, so not as good an outcome. And in the final one in the control, what we actually see is that two improved and two didn't. So what this tells us you know, if this was actually a trial, was it actually uh, performance changes over time, regardless of whether or not you go in. And so we need to be able to um, be confident about whether the second intervention is really that different from the control group where we didn't do anything at all. Um, whether that's just a function of the fact that what people put in their bin changes week to week. Uh, so there's statistical tests that actually allow us to compare whether or not these groups are actually uh, statistically different from each other and therefore we can be confident that the intervention that we put in actually led to the difference. Does that kind of make sense to people um, as an idea of, you know, this kind of trial is to, to get a people to split them into groups to try something and then compare um, that to other groups to see whether or not what we've done has worked? I think it does. Um, I'm wondering what data you're using um, to base the interventions on. So how are you selecting the interventions? Yeah, so that, that's one of the things that we will look at in detail. Um, for example, this, um, this uh, first session that we're looking at is online communications. And so we'll obviously be using um, uh, online actions, whether that's, you know, selecting particular types of um, answers or clicks, you know, those sorts of things. And so um, the online trials, as we'll look at, are um, kind of preliminary trials. They give us preliminary evidence. The field trials, where, um, which is the next session, is where we actually go out work with councils to actually deliver things on the ground and then look very closely at, you know, what's actually going in their bins. And we talk a little bit about in the next section about how we can reliably measure what's changing in bins, because I know obviously the gold standard would be kind of, you know, a physical composition audit, but, you know, that's hellishly expensive and unlikely to be able to be affordable um, for the number of households we want to involve. So what we sort of do is we look at the evidence about um, what is likely to work and we pick a particular intervention and then we work with the partners to say, what data can you reasonably collect? And do we consider that to be reliable enough to be able to give us this confidence at the end? So it's kind of right. an iterative process. Yep. Um, we actually have 2018 regional bin audit data. So we already know that bagged recyclables, loose soft plastics are an issue in our, across our region. They're our two number, they're the two biggest um, contaminants for us. Um, so we have got some data already there that we could use. Yeah, that's fabulous. Thanks, Linda. And, and certainly uh, we picked these contaminants because over and again, they came up um, at the top of the list that we were seeing for everyone. But it's really great to have that um, confirmed and great to hear um, that you might have some baseline data to be able to draw on. Um, for everyone else, does this idea, just this kind of, that, as I said, this is really conceptual at this stage, but we'll get down into the nitty gritty of what um, the online experiments will actually look like. But just this idea of trying to test things. Um, is that enough of an explanation now? And then hopefully it'll become clearer as we get into the detail. Yep, sounds good. Okay, great. Well, if there's um, no other questions, please, as I said, feel free to stop at any time. Use the chat um, if you don't want to interrupt or just um, yell out. Uh, so as I said, two types of um, experiments planned, online experiments and field trials. So just as a high level for those of you who aren't staying for the next session on field trials, um, what we're talking about is literally actually going out into the community um, or uh, doing direct communications either by you know, broadcast advertising, for example, um, 
engagement where you actually go to people's properties, other types of um, interventions where you're actually changing the services, for example, that you offer. And basically um, what happens is we'll be looking at kind of three main types of trials is that we'll be looking at a traditional education approaches that are used by um, a large number of councils and whether there's anything we can learn from the behavioural sciences to improve the effectiveness of those traditional approaches. We'll be looking at um, promising approaches uh, that some councils, in fact, in some cases, many councils are already doing uh, that seem to be giving good results, but the kind of the quantitative data or the statistical analysis hasn't um, uh, really been there to give uh, overall confidence. Um, and so, you know, bin tagging is a, is a good example of that, where it's um, being done by a lot of councils. Um, there's a lot of really positive feedback. Councils are feeling that it's working for them, but there's no published data about how effective it is. So if other councils want to make a decision about whether it's worth the cost of investing at the moment, that data doesn't exist. And then the final one is actually looking at kind of, you know, what we're kind of calling novel options, which uh, some councils may actually be playing around with already, but they're not common across kind of published evaluation reports um, or other research that we've done. And so um, uh, in the next session, we'll be, next session, we'll be looking at these in more detail, but we're really open to what councils are actually doing in this space and what they're looking, um, what they're feeling is really working. Um, but today, what we're, well, first, what we're really interested in is the online experiments. So we're going to go through them um, in a little bit more detail. So the, I, as I said before, the online experiments are really a preliminary kind of trial uh, where we can test different types of materials and messaging to see what effect they have on things like people's attention um, and their, their willingness to take small actions. But obviously, um, when we're doing online experiments, we don't actually get to check uh, what's actually happening to people's actual behaviours and what's going in their bin. So we don't have uh, kind of, you know, the, the final evidence. They're just giving us indications of what might work. And the two ways that we're looking at testing um, in online is through online panel surveys uh, and Facebook advertising. And these lend themselves uh, to testing different types of things. So our online panel surveys uh, will actually be looking at uh, some preliminary testing of whether different types of uh, systems, the curbside systems work, particularly increasing the number of streams um, and how that helps people make decisions about where to put things where, and also uh, education materials and how easy it is for people to kind of comprehend and remember what's on us, say for example, a recycling flyer and then be able to use that information to make sorting decisions. Uh, the Facebook advertising will be um, much more simple, obviously, what uh, the space that you have to communicate um, through Facebook is, you know, generally a square. Um, we'll look at whether there's different messages or um, perhaps visuals that, that grab more attention and lead to more um, kind of preliminary actions like clicking through to a website to read more. Uh, so with the uh, online panel surveys, and this is just an overview and we'll go down in quite some detail um, in a moment, but what... Uh, the way a survey kind of works um, is that we actually uh, present uh, the people, so, so actually, so online panel survey, we collect a random sample of people who are interested in doing surveys generally, not specifically related to waste, but they sign up to panel companies and say, I'm happy to do surveys. And panel companies collect a lot of information about who they are, where they live, and then we can request a panel from them and say, we want a panel that's representative of New South Wales or a panel that's representative of Australia, for example. And obviously on online panel surveys are only representative of the internet um, and computer literate population in Australia. So again, it's not perfect. Um, there are some people that won't be represented in these surveys, uh, you know, whether it's due to age, uh, language or technology, access to technology, um, but they give us a general sense um, of uh, what a large proportion of the population is thinking. And so the way the survey would work is we would give them some questions that actually check currently how well they sort different materials into bins. Then we would present some sort of information or message or other uh, thing. And then we would check that sorting again and we would see if the um, presentation of, you know, whether it's a flyer or, you know, extra bins to put things in, um, whether that's enabled them to be able to sort better the second time around than they did uh, compared to the first. In the Facebook advertising, basically what we do is we uh, show different messages, obviously, um, and then we see which types of messages get more clicks, get more likes, get more shares, and hopefully um, if we can get the data, you know, which messages might lead people to stay longer on your website if you've got, you know, a list of, of what is and isn't recyclable or other information, do any of the messages encourage people to spend more time trying to engage with that information? 
Um, so we're going to go through these in, in detail um, to look at what they might involve and, and particularly the types of things we're going to, um, we're keen to test. But again, just want to pause and just check because I tend to just talk and talk and talk. Um, so are there any questions at this high level um, about online panel surveys or Facebook advertising um, before we get into the detail of how they'll work in practice? No, nope. okay, we'll move on. Like I said, stop me at any time. Um, so starting with uh, online panel surveys. Uh, so like I said, the process is that we um, test how they uh, currently sort uh, common contaminants. And uh, because we know that contamination differs across areas, um, we will have a general list about what we think is and is acceptable in the yellow bin based on the data collected by Planet Arc and APCO for the Australian Recycling Label. Um, but uh, council partners can also choose to check that list and to nominate if anything is uh, different for their particular council. And as part of the screening for surveys, we will identify which council people belong to, and then we'll, we'll actually be testing them based on your list of, um, or we can, that's, that's an option to test them based on your list of what isn't, isn't acceptable. So we check um, what, how they currently sort things, then we present something like a recycling flyer, different types of streams, certain types of messages, for example, and then we test again. So for example, if we were going to test um, different types of recycling flyers, uh, the first thing we would do is we would check their current sorting. So we might have a question um, like the following. Oops, I'm sorry. Um, I'm just trying to get my screen so I can see. Um, so th these are just examples at this stage. We haven't put them through our, um, our technical survey people to make sure the wording is correct. But, you know, as an example of, of how the survey might read, we would say, you know, we're going to give you a, a list of items. Um, and what we want you to do is tell us uh, which, you would norm which bin you would normally put them in when they're at home. And we'd give them the option of the red and the yellow bin um, and potentially a, a, a n neither item uh, option. Um, and then we'd be looking at items that are commonly uh, meant to go in the yellow bin or are commonly put in the yellow bin, which obviously shouldn't be there. And so, you know, it'd be a combination of labelled items with pictures, um, for example, and we'd have some in there that are we know to be tricky. For example, you know, it's quite common for people to put Pyrex or broken glass into the recycling because they think glass is recyclable. Um, bagged material, dirty material, um, small items, for example. So we have a list, um, sorry, a, a selection of things that um, are and are not meant to go in the yellow bin and see whether or not they correctly choose the right destination for them. Then we would present um, some information. So for example, this, the next question, once they've gone through all of those items, might have some context that say, you know, did you know recycling is actually different? We want you to imagine you've moved to a new area and uh, they've given you this flyer and we want you to have a look at this flyer. And we might provide um, different people with different examples um, sorry, I'm just reading this out so you can see, um, but you can see it there. So we might check about um, whether the material, the flyer, includes um, what's allowed in the recycling bin or covers both the recycling and the rubbish bin. Um, we'll be leaving the, the green bin, the garden, um, and potentially food waste organics bin out of this entire survey. So we'll just be looking at red and yellow um, throughout this uh, trial. But so we'll look at things like whether they, whether icons or pictures resonate, whether there's other types of messaging like persuasive messaging, um, as opposed to just the instructions. Um, and uh, so we'll get a whole bunch of different things. And these are obviously just illustrations of different types of flyers that we've um, found out there. And what we'll do as part of um, the process of designing the survey is for those um, councils who agree or decide to be partners on the survey, uh, anyone who wants to test their own flyer can provide that flyer and then we'll take the uh, flyers that people consider best practice and we'll use some of those and we'll also potentially design some based on behavioural principles and then we'll test the different flyers to be able to see do people find reading any particular type of um, flyer easier to comprehend and to remember in a short period of time so that when we then go to the final question which is to check um, the sorting again based on the information in the flyer whether or not they're more able to, whether they're able to more correctly sort uh, the items into the right bin based on the flyer. So that's kind of how a survey might work in terms of the questions. Are there any um, questions at this stage about that particular type of panel survey? No? 
Um, so the second type of survey that we would look at um, potentially doing is actually one around source separation and whether we can gather any preliminary evidence um, to suggest um, or to confirm perhaps the reports that say that um, increased source separation is actually easier for residents to sort. So this would have a similar, um, a similar design to the last one where we would check current sorting by presenting a series of um, items that uh, and asking them where they would normally put them. But then what we would do this time, instead of doing for flyers, we would actually have a question that says, we want you to imagine you've moved to a new area and they actually have um, different bins. And here's the bins that are now available to you. And can you resort those items? So for example, and these, as I said, these are just examples, um, but we might present a scenario where they actually split out, uh, split out the current commingled recycling into three streams. So they might have a containers for metal and plastic containers, they might have a glass containers and a paper cardboard separate. Um, and then actually an, an e-waste uh, collection um, on top of that. And we give them the same list of items and we say now which bin would you put them in if this was your um, system and we see if it's easier for them to sort particular types of um, items easier. We might also combine the extra streams with additional information. So we might you know, create some kind of uh, bin wraps that are, you know, the equivalent of like a flyer, but, you know, provide some additional information about what is and isn't allowed in those um, different streams to again see if that helps. Um, and then just as a, as a control, we also just check, check the standard one, um, just the two stream with uh, similar information just to make sure that it's, is it to do with the information that we provide or is it to do with having number of streams? So we give them those and then we give them back the um, list of items and ask them to check how they would sort it and see whether they get more, or basically whether they get less contamination having more streams or not. So that's the second um, one and that might be particularly interesting uh, for councils who are considering having additional streams uh, because this could be customised based on uh, for individual streams based on individual councils. So our partner council might say, we're interested in what happens if we have, you know, for example, um, glass separate, or if we have glass and paper separate, or if we introduce a textiles, you know, for example, and then we would customize the list of items that people are sorting on, again, based on what should and um, often, um, sh what should and shouldn't be in, but is often placed in uh, incorrectly. So we, in one sense, uh, placing items that are designed to trip people up uh, or that commonly trip people up so that we can see if anything actually helps them um, to be less tricked uh, by that. So that's the second type of survey. Again, any questions on, on that as a potential um, experiment that your council might be interested in? I think that looks good. We've got councils introducing glass currently. Um, and I think one might even be tossing up a paper cardboard. So I think that one looks really good. Yeah, I had to see actually, uh, because I didn't know what colour the glass uh, bin would yep. be. So I, I saw it on one of the Victorian things. And I know a couple of councils in um, New South Wales currently have a separate paper cardboard. I think it might be uh, Leichhardt in Inner West, Gabriella. Yeah, and it's Leichhardt in and Waverley. And Waverley, that's right. Yeah, so I'm just wondering how we would do it. Like, is it is it going to be location based? The surveys. Yeah, so as part of the filtering, um, when at the beginning of each survey, people would be required to um, give some sort of location details. It might be a postcode. It might mm. be to select their council from a drop down, and then have additional help if they don't know their council. Um, but there would certainly be uh, if a council wants to provide a tailored option. Um, so there's an option for council to just say, hey, we're just generally interested to see what the results are if we do different things. Um, yes. Just, well, let's just test it in our community, but use the, the general um, uh, kind of, you know, New South Wales standard or Victorian standard, for example. Um, or council might say, actually, we're interested in testing specific things for our community. And so we'd have that filter and it would show different options for different councils if that if that was of interest and value. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds good. I'll chat with other people in the team to see what they, they think about that because that could be helpful for us as well. Any other questions on this idea of a, a source separation survey? Like you said, it's obviously very preliminary um, and you would only expect that this would help with uh, things that are obviously in um, 
these different streams. But, you know, for example, if you have a glass containers, it wouldn't necessarily stop people from putting py Pyrex in. Um, but it might, we might notice that it actually helps with things like glassware, for example, because, you know, it's not a container. But so that's, oops, what we're hoping to be able to see from this sort of survey. Um, and uh, there's, you know, possibilities of doing other things too. So this is just two examples where what we introduce in the middle is a flyer or a different um, bin setup. But of course, there may be other things that we might want to test with a similar setup where we check how they sort, we give them some sort of information or something, and then we check again. And that will be um, open to, to what potential um, delivery partners are interested in, in knowing and testing for their community. Jenny, would you still have a, an option for neither? So you've got baseline there with rubbish and recycling. Would you still put a, an option there for neither? Because things like um, compact fluoros, um, we don't want them being thrown in the e-waste. If we had e-waste bins, we wouldn't want them in there because of the risk of them being broken. Um, you know, and there's still things, uh, we're in a regional area, rural and regional area, so things like um, uh, chemical containers and um, even engine oil containers, you wouldn't want going into any of those um, source separation options. Yeah, definitely. So, so the question about whether we include a neither or not um, option uh, will be the same across all surveys, will be based right. on which items we ultimately select and whether we select some items that don't belong in any of the bins because, you know, for example, we know that batteries end up in, um, in recycling and we want to know if people are putting them in recycling or not. Yep. Um, you know, and, and the examples that you gave. So, yes, uh, we would always include a neither if we were including an item that shouldn't be in any of the bins, definitely. Yep. Uh, it's just a bit complicated about how we check what people are doing with that because you would usually follow up that with a next question which was like what would you do with it and <clears throat> we'd have to think that through so we would use it where um, we're valuable definitely yeah uh, we've just recently had a situation where we've um, done some education in a primary school and we were talking about the incoming glass bin in that council area and the question came up about compact fluoros you know do they go in the into the glass bin and of course we don't want them in there because of the mercury so that's automatically something to think about from a glass point of view yeah definitely um so yes for sure we're interested one of the things that would happen as part of the co-design forum which we'll talk about later but that's the step where we actually work out what this looks like exactly for interested partners is we would get those lists from people that you're interested in checking and we would like i said in in, in the nicest way possible try and trip people up um, mm -hmm. to see whether or not things help them make better decisions. Any other questions on kind of the survey um, idea before we move on to the Facebook advertising? Okay, so um, Facebook advertising basically, uh, you know, we show different messages and then we check which performs better. So you use the Facebook um, advertising platform and sort of all the instructions would be provided on how to do that. And the idea is we basically come up with different combinations of, say, for example, um, visuals or headers, and we check how they uh, work. So we might, for example, um, use messages like, you know, that recycling correctly is important or why recycling correctly is important, that recycling works um, when people do it right or if people do it right, uh, that most people who think they can recycle still get uh, things wrong. So different types of messages to see if uh, uh, different things resonate with people um, and make them more likely to take an action. We might try different types of uh, images and we can, for example, test uh, new ideas based on these types of messages and images with existing um, social media posts that you guys do already. And um, because it's Facebook and what we can ask people to do from Facebook that we can actually test is quite limited, they would be based on very kind of proxy actions. So for example, clicking through to your council website to read more information, or perhaps you know completing a recycling quiz that lets them test what they can do. So they're very basic. Um, actions, but what we're doing is testing whether different types of messaging um, or potentially different types of visuals grab people's attention and hold people's attention. And just in case you've never done kind of the, the Facebook testing or, or seen that sort of thing, as an example, this is obviously not a waste one, um, but here's a, a, you know, a suite of six different um, Facebook uh, posts that all lead back to the same thing. And you can see there's a um, a variety of different headings that are involved, uh, different images and different messages. And what happens is that uh, through the Facebook platform, we craft these different uh, ads. 
And then Facebook actually randomly puts them out to different parts of your viewers so that each viewer only sees one of these ads, but it collects uh, information about who saw them, who clicked, who liked, for example. Um, and, you know, we might, for example, try different types of messaging, seeing whether there's particular persuasive messaging that actually gets people to pay attention, like I said, to click through to a quiz or to a um, council website. So these are just some of the you know, ideas that came out of brainstorming from um, some of our council, uh, some, some of our interviewees. Um, and I'll share obviously all these slides later so you can have a look at them. Um, but these are the types of things that people think might work. Uh, so we will put them in different uh, Facebook ads and see whether or not any of these types of messages actually cause people to click more frequently. Uh, we might also try different types of visuals. So we might try, um, you know, having, uh, <clears throat> you know, ones that are very uh, graphical, ones that are uh, text-based but, but quite simple, um, you know, whether there's different ways of presenting the information that, again, the idea about is about seeing what grabs people's attention, what holds people's attention long enough to make sense of it, and what um, then motivates them to actually take a very small action. Um, and then uh, Facebook, you, you put these all into the Facebook platform and then Facebook actually helps you um, to decide. So say, you know, we came up with three uh, ads. These are just examples, they don't really make sense, but say we came up with three ads and we put them through. Facebook would then give us data that comes back and says how many people liked each of them, how many people clicked through and how many people actually did whatever, you know, the next action was. So for example, if it was a quiz, we could see how many people actually completed the quiz. Uh, if it was uh, a council website, potentially, we might be able to get data from your web team about how long people stayed on the web page and actually looked at that information, for example. And so we can start to get a sense back from them whether particular types of messages or particular ways of presenting um, actually, um, like I said, grab and hold attention long enough. Um, oh, and then, so, sorry, so on Facebook, um, on the Facebook advertising, uh, any questions about that um, trial? Like I said, um, as before, the types of messages that we use, the types of visuals that we use would be designed with our interested trial partners um, to get a sense of what you're currently doing, what you think might work, what the literature suggests might work, and put together some options for different councils to trial in their communities. Any questions? No, I think that looks good. I think that um, we're building a social media following at the moment and um, this would be a really interesting thing to do because half our, or more than half our councils have been affected by um, the closure of SKM and there's a lot of um, people who want to do the right thing but are feeling very negative about recycling. So it'd be interesting to see what the results from this would um, present. Yeah, and that's and definitely one of the things where um, obviously uh, local or regional flavours um, can be uh, easily incorporated. And so sometimes we might look at a particular different, uh, we would look at messages that relate to different barriers. So some of those barriers might be trust or scepticism uh, in the system, particularly around recent events, and particularly in Victoria, although not just, um, not just limited to Victoria. Uh, you know, other barriers are the overconfident um, people who think they know how to recycle uh, but don't. Um, you know, other barriers around people who just don't take enough effort. So we'd see if there's different messages to overcome some of those different um, barriers and could definitely tailor them to what you think are the issues in your community. So what we would probably end up doing is, you know, I'm making the numbers up, but say 20 different messages and each council could potentially pick five, you know, that they wanted to test in their... Um, community, 20 is probably too many, but, but anyway, you yeah. might have a, a broader list and councils can um, select the ones that they really want to see in their community. Yeah. Um, so the other thing we would do once we tested that is that we then might take some of those uh, messages um, that seem to be resonating in uh, the Facebook and we might use them to develop uh, uh, more involved surveys to see whether some of those messages then flow on from not just people clicking to see whether or not, you know, something is recyclable or not in a quiz or on a website, but whether it actually, you know, for example, particularly if we're testing, you know, like if in doubt, leave it out um, types of messages, whether the way we present those messages might actually help people be more careful, for example, when they sort. So we would do a similar kind of survey where we have the same questions. Uh, we give them those types of messages like if in doubt or some of the, um, 
some of the kind of instructional uh, messages that seemed to resonate and we would check how they saw it. Um, so that's kind of what the experiments themselves might look like. Um, the next step is to actually look, like, look at what would be involved for you guys to be um, a partner in this. But just before we move on, are there any final questions about um, how the experiments themselves work? Yeah, um, I just had a question. In Willoughby, we have quite a diverse community. So usually for some of our illegal dumping Facebook campaigns, we'll get them translated into different languages. Is that something that you'd be interested in in the trial or will it sort of dilute the results? Oh, look, uh, definitely can be considered. So certainly um, our project doesn't have any resources for translation, but that doesn't mean that we couldn't work with you to do similar things. Um, and what, what you would probably do is you would just run them as separate mini trials. So you would have an English trial in your community and then you would um, uh, translate them into a different language and you would run that as its own trial because that would help you see whether messages resonated differently with different communities based on language, which is not quite doesn't quite define your communities, but you know whether uh, whether messages resonate with English speaking populations or you know Chinese speaking or Vietnamese speaking populations, for example, more or less, and you can start to get a sense of this is a fairly universal message and this seems to resonate with everybody, regardless of what language background they come from, or these messages resonate really highly with this group, but not at all with this group. So definitely um, something that can be done quite easily and, and very open to looking at that with interested okay. partners. I'm just going to make a note because I hadn't thought of it, but it is actually um, a really good point. And it's certainly the case too for the surveys. Uh, if you have large populations um, of non-English speaking um, communities, then we can also look at if, if you're particularly interested in any of the sur panel survey approaches, whether or not um, you know you might want to get those translated as well. Sorry, I have a fly that's um, buzzing around me at the moment. Very interested in these trials as well. Any other questions? I'll move on then to um, the delivery partner side of things. I just noticed that, like I said, I love to talk and it's so much to share. And I wanna make sure we get through all of this without rushing um, too much. So um, in terms of partnering, obviously uh, there's a number of benefits uh, that your council would get from partnering uh, with the online panel surveys. Obviously uh, you would, uh, both learn a little bit about behavioural design principles in how you construct, you know, for example, flyers or messaging, um, things like that. You would get a chance to benchmark your own material if you wanted to include it in the trial um, and uh, be part of, you know, um, learning what's working better, particularly for your community, um, which is the benefit. Obviously, other councils who don't participate will still be able to access these results, um, but they will have to know what works at a high level. Like, for example, these are the results for New South Wales. Um, but if you, if you are one of the partners, you get to check whether or not it actually resonates in your particular community. Um, similarly for the Facebook um, thing, you get to benchmark your own uh, social uh, media posts. You could potentially also test different comm styles. So we know that um, some uh, councils have developed, uh, you know, communication guidelines around voice and things like that, but, uh, you know, particular types of voice or whatever in, in terms of the, the style. Um, of communicating with a resident, but this particular thing, you know, might be a chance to see whether there are different ways of communicating that actually um, might resonate more uh, with your community. Um, with the online panel surveys, they're run centrally, so there's very little effort uh, involved is one of the benefits. Um, the Facebook uh, ones uh, are run by councils, but they're very fairly easy to do because we help with the messaging and you kind of just have to put them together. Uh, potentially uh, your, um, your council might be involved in the design if you wanted to um, try particular types of visual design, but again, they're still fairly easy um, to run. Um, but in terms of the requirements, there's obviously a number of things that we need our trial partners um, to do for us as well. So um, for panel surveys, uh, obviously uh, just some general things, uh, we would ask you to do what we're calling an in good faith commitment to participate. Um, so you uh, sign up by saying, yes, we're keen to participate, but we obviously, uh, want to design a trial that's going to work for you. So we ask you again at the end, um, whether or not you're still keen to go ahead. So you're not kind of signing your life away at the beginning. Um, but we ask you to, to, you know, to work with us in good faith. And um, we'll ask you to provide examples of existing materials and to attend our forum with us to help design what they will actually look like. Uh, you then also uh, be required to contribute um, some cash towards the central survey costs. And, and if you want a um, representative sample in your own LGA and my um, my 
contracts person was very um, uncomfortable with me putting dollar values in here because we have no idea uh, what the cost of these surveys will be until we've designed them. But as a very rough benchmark, uh, we imagine that the survey, online panel survey, would be kind of in the vicinity of three to $5,000, depending on how big a sample you want in your community. Um, so that's per individual trial partner and that collectively goes together to run a very big survey. And you'd obviously need to confirm the contamination list. Um, Facebook advertising similarly, um, you know, make a commitment to work through with us, provide examples of your materials and attend our forum. Uh, you would then need to run um, and pay for the advertising campaign, which again, we're um, estimating to be around about the $1,000 advertising budget. Um, there would be additional costs, as I said, if, or if you want to do an in-house resource costs or cash um, costs if you want to get particular visual design done. Uh, you then need to obviously provide the data back to us and if you're testing a, a link back to your website, hopefully you can also provide us some of that web data. Um, so that's the kind of the general requirements that we would need from you to, um, to participate. And also just a standard, um, all of the trials, we're publishing all of the results. So if you participate, you need to agree that um, we can publish the data. Uh, that you collect or that we collect on your behalf, but obviously we can anonymize councils in the actual reporting so that we don't say in Willoughby Council, you know, this or this or that, we just say Council A, Council B, Council D. Um, so that's kind of what's required. Are there any questions um, around that generally? Yeah, Jenny, um, just with the sample size, what types of sample sizes are you looking for with those kinds of uh, engagement styles. Yeah, that's that's one of the things that we need to work out. And um, we have kind of trial design experts at Behaviour Works, which is not me, um, who answer some of those questions. Um, but it's mm -hmm. partly related to population size. So we need to know the size um, and the, uh, I guess, a variety in your council. Um, but you know, we'd be uh, for the kind of the survey. Um, things we'd be kind of probably looking at a minimum of three to five hundred people in each council area, which would obviously sum up to a higher um, number. We'd want to be hopefully getting at least a thousand people across New South Wales and Victoria. Um, but again, it depends on interest from um, councils. So that's one of the things that we would um, discuss and negotiate once we know who's interested, uh, how many things we're testing. So if you're only testing two things, you don't need as large a sample size as if you're testing five things, for example. So that's one of the questions that we uh, work out at the forum. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Um, it's just a couple of bits more information about being involved, but I don't want to move too quickly. Um, there we are. Just some other information that you'll need to know in terms of really approximate timeframes. So we're looking at having the co-design, um, sorry, I keep calling them forums, but I mean co-design workshops. Um, at the end of November, early December, and we'll hopefully have those dates by the beginning of next week to share. Um, after that, we would actually uh, negotiate with uh, interested um, councils to get agreements in place because there obviously will be cash and or in-kind contributions um, required. We'll then uh, look at doing the source separation, hopefully by the end of this year, if we can fit it in before Christmas or before people kind of start um, shutting off for Christmas, um, but then looking at the Facebook experiments and the other um, surveys in kind of Feb to May next year and finishing with what we're calling policy forums, which is basically these dissemination of results um, across all of the trials. And at the same time, the field trials will be going on um, uh, in, in parallel to these. Um, in terms of the actual process, so uh, the next step is actually an expression of interest form, which we'll send around uh, tomorrow afternoon to everyone who attends one of the forums. Um, we'll then invite everyone uh, who completes the form to attend the workshop with us. Um, and then we'll uh, reach agreement with the delivery partners uh, to get our final list. So the EOI form, um, as I said, there's an in good faith agreement, but it's not contractually binding. Um, then there's a workshop where we actually define the individual trials and what's going on. You obviously need to go back to your council then um, to confirm that you're happy with that. We will also do a short list of all of the trials that come up in that co-design forum and then the agreement um, individually with, with each partner to go ahead. So as I said, the next step is the expression of interest form, um, which will be sent out. It's uh, quite a lot of fields, but mostly it's just tick box. And then there's just spaces if you want to add extra detail. And it's basically to get a sense of um, your context so that we can start to see uh, what types of councils we have interested, what you're interested in, 
and what you uh, can potentially offer or, or, or contribute to the trials. Um, and then uh, at the co-design workshop, we'll go through a number of things. So you'll actually uh, get a chance to come and see our research and what we've come to find out at the moment. We'll go through these trials again um, in a bit of a high level. We'll look at actually establishing teams of councils who wanna explore the same sort of things, selecting the particular type of approaches, brainstorming them in more detail. Then we'll have a bit of a prioritizing prioritization process where you can vote on the ones that are most interesting to your council, start to think through the evaluation, um, back to your point, Linda, about the types of data, um, and then wrap it up. And then once the forum is finished, we'll then actually go through this shortlisting process. So for the online experiments, for what we're doing at this session, in one sense, we kind of um, have no limit on how many people we can work with. Um, so it's just basically how many people are interested in um, the different topics. With the field trials, um, those numbers will still be confirmed, but we'll look at that more in the next section. Um, so any, sorry, any section, any questions on um, that process uh, at a high level, obviously when you're filling out the EOI form, if you are interested in going ahead, you can contact me for more information then as well. No, that's, that's actually the end then. Um, if there are any other questions um, at all about uh, what's going on, otherwise we'll wrap up and move on to the next input section on field trials. So any final questions from anyone? Hope that's clear and that uh, it's given you guys enough uh, information to know um, if this is something you want to be involved in on the online side of things and hopefully uh, when I send out the forms, you guys will be keen to partner and, and send back to us. Well done, Jenny. Thanks, guys. Okay, if you're um, staying for the uh, the uh, field trial session, you can just stay online. Um, as I said, we will repeat um, the beginning bit and I'll just say goodbye then to everybody else who isn't staying for the next session. And I'll just... Um,